So as you know, this intergenerational series puts uh, younger and older generations of feminists in conversation with each other and also in conversation with us, the audience. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, today's seminar is Feminist Art, Artist and Decolonizing Modes of Feminist Knowledge Production. And it explores the language and embodied weapons that feminist artists and activists provide us uh, with that move us to protest, that provide us to move us to protest, sing, chant and organize for substantive and intersectional gender justice. The conversation will feature a panel of artists, scholars and activists who ask how feminist theory moves beyond the theoretical to constitute, constitute a lived, embodied and aesthetic practice and asking what it takes to decolonize modes of feminist knowledge produ production. So this is taking us sort of out of the realm of theory in, in its abstract to a lived experience through art. And, and I think this is really very interesting and very exciting as also thinking through epistemological issues. So thank you so much to the four of you. And we are going to start with um, Jolene Phillips. Uh, Jolene, can you um, switch on your camera? Um, she is a lecturer in the department of um, Langsal in the Afrikaans unit where she lectures Afrikaans methodology and Afrikaans teachers and Afrikaans literature. She's an award-winning poet and she re has received the Eugene Marais Prize for her epic poem, Bintang, the UJ Depu Prize for Radbrak and the NIHSS Best Fiction Prize for her prose collection. Ching Chang Cherries. This year she has uh, was honored for the Kunster Onbepak Prize for a young voice in the creative arts. She produced, wrote and started and de debuted the production Bintang Blutspur Gang Collective at the Kaka in Car Festival in March 2022 as well as the South Worcester Fears in May 2022. She is a grant holder for the NIHSS Working Group Program for a research which has funded this program. Jolene, is that how you pronounce your name? Jolene. Jolene. So, so welcome, Jolene. And it's wonderful to see at, at this young age how much you've achieved already. Um, each speaker will have about 15 minutes. Um, so we, we and I will introduce the others as, as we move along. Over to you. Hi, good morning. <laughs> um, so I, I work. Are we are we present? Yes. Um. So I will I will sp speak um on behalf of my research that I'm busy doing, which is looking at the female epic, um, which has, as a result, um, brought up a lot of the performative work that I've done. Um, so people ask me why, why do, why write an epic um, if it's thousands of years old? What could you possibly, um, what could you possibly add to such an old form of literature? Um, but I also found that even though it's really old, it is mostly governed and written by male um male poets or epic poets um and then more specifically um in the south african context um the first epic poet um was um let me just now ts plaiki um and then moving down to the language that i write um the afrikaans poets um are mostly are in fact all male um, epic poets, um, and then the first um, epic epic poem written by a woman about a woman has been written in 1989 by Anki Kroch. And so moving further down to 2020, it was then me. So I think for the first 200 years, the first epic had been written by a woman about a woman, both sort of seen as, in, sort of seen as um, marginal figures, being a woman, 
And then also looking at a epic, looking at a indigenous, so-called indigenous woman. Um, and so Bintang comes from, um, I visited a cave in Hermanus from where I stay, my loving Hans by, and I came across the Bintang story where it's called Bintang's Cave. And I looked into, so at the back of the menu, it tells you where she comes from. She swore a lot. Um, and so I started going into the research about where it comes from. And I looked at the histories of Hermanus. I looked at the histories of the Southern Cape and I could not find any histories around, uh, around this woman, let alone indigenous people or people of color. Um, so I had nothing to start with, even though the epic asks for, and it represents the hero, represents the, the national, um, yeah, it sort of represents the national history of, of a place. It sort of carries the culture um, in this. And so that is how I began, began. So I then started with the idea of the fragmented epic. And I also work in, in my own art. I work very frag, in fragments, um, which is fragmented poetry, epic poetry, um, is exactly designed or exactly um, started because you are not in opposition of what has been written or in opposition of patriarchy, but that the instead of the history saying that women are always included in the epic form, it's never by a woman. So the history of that is really small. So I had really nothing, almost nothing to other than the back of a of a of a menu. Um, and then only up until I, only up until I was going, when I went to the Netherlands, I came across um, the word bintang in a form of a bottle of beer. And I immediately uh, Googled it and it found out it was an island. It has many, it means celestial body. And then I thought to myself, isn't that quite the plight of women that we are supposed to be stars because in Tagalog, bintang means accusation. And I thought to myself, isn't that the plight of women where in literature um, it is um, uh, women are raised to be stars and then when you do get there, you are accused for it. Um, and so there were many things with regards to my own womanhood and my own identity as a, as a female poet, um, also brown poet, um, also struggling with that racial identities around that that I after I've written after I wrote the Bintang epic poem, I um, started to feel like there was something missing. There was still something that needed to be concluded. So I invited artists to come and sit with me. Um, with Bintang, bringing my Bintang as a sort of like artifact to the process. And then, um, so we had Fraser Barry, Amelda Brandt, who led the, who's the um, director and also who led the workshop process in the applied theater context. Um, and we also had a, a professional actor in, in the play. And we all started to work from the now. And we all started to start thinking about what it means to be an indigenous person in the context of in the contemporary time, because what we do now when we think about indigenous indigenousness, we immediately trace ourselves back to how people in South Africa lived many years ago, which comes with all the um, histories with say, slavery and genocide. Um, but also pulled me towards the project was that the back of the, uh, let alone the sort of stereotypical things that are of, afforded to to indigenous women, um, it said that she was the last koi person. And for me, that was such an erasure of culture, of 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 heritage, of uh, cultural practices and art, creative art forms by saying that because there are still people in Hermanus, there are people that are descendant from many um, groups, um, from many indigenous groups. Um, and so I started to also 
sit with that sort of things like how does one become a last and unfortunately when we look at the term um it is considered a moribund language means which they say moribund to the language but how does one eviscerate then a language when it's sort of seen as a a, a fossil that can never die um it's something that travels with human beings so what must happen what happened for an indigenous person to for a group of people in fact many groups of people to just disappear by the early 1800s um my research tells me that um only two or three and now nowadays we just know that Pung and the the Nama people and the Zwanzi people are small groups that are sort of migrated to Botswana and so these are the things that I started to use in my creative arts practice um, so that it's not how does the how does one then deal with this? Because if there's no history that you can pull upon, if if the only sort of epic poem speaks of the Afrikaner national um, ep epic, if Afrikaner identity is afforded to only white South Africans in the historical context, um, what I'm so calling myself an Afrikaner um, has is complex and um, it's difficult because the identity, the cultural and racial identity um, in literature has has established that the Afrikaner is a, a, a white person. Um, so I had to sit with all of these things and even us working in the theater production sat with all of because it wasn't just my artifact that I was bringing but everyone either in music or in performance or in uh, we also had an art fine artist because it um that we use with artifacts um so while Bintang now enjoys being a epic poem what does how does one take it to stage and how do we represent Bintang um, as a physical form, how do you start? How do you start representing indigenousness now without, uh, you know, departing from the sort of women that has been presented? Um, my research also, in terms of feminism, I think I wouldn't. I don't know if I can call it that, but we all know that uh, indigenous women like Rutoa and Sarki Bartman um, have the sort of idea that um, these people were, these women were subservient, that they had no agency, that it was just, they were just taken that. Um, and then, but the history tells us that um, a woman that pre precedes these two women um, are, is called Narina by um, Francois Levayant, whose research I also used. And he says in his diaries that he tried to lure her to come with him to the Netherlands um, because she had um, royal status, um, this woman he calls Narina. Um, and she says, no, I don't want to go with you. I, I love my I love my country. I love my place. I don't have to go and join queens and kings overseas. I understand my power here. Um, and so all of these aspects in my creative journey up until now, um, are really difficult things to sit with, but in the performance, um, people left you know, taking the story with them because it was never our intention to tell people what to do. And so working in the fragmented allows you to allows you to to break from tradition, to break from your own identities that you can, work in a mosaic way to start engaging with these different things because a woman isn't just um feminism um is is a form that is that re the response to identity and and um and society and one couldn't possibly put all of that on stage but if you work fragmented you start to put the elements together and the artifacts together to form um, the project that I have now um, and very much working in a, um, well, um, people talk about decoloniality, um, 
but it still includes the word um, or looking at not people, but research, um, decoloniality has taken a lot of shape in at um, tertiary education, at tertiary um, institutions. Um, it is now encouraged to be included in the curriculums and general practices of, of pedagogy. Um, but for me, it still has the word colony in it. It still has the word colonialism in it. And recently, in my research, I'm also speaking to the transdisciplinary form and rather instead of the multidisciplinary form and start talking about an Africa-centered methodology instead of a decoloniality uh, method. Um, and But it is important to depart from the decoloniality because it does inform um, why you depart from a form, why you try to challenge an art form, why you try to add to it, um, why how you try to reshape it. Um, especially like if I come to language specifically, um, looking at my thing of being a poet is I, sp I write in the Hans by variety, which isn't, there's not a lot of research there. So where I got my, what I have is, is oral history. What I have is what I got was um, research on fishermen and the language around that. Um, um, and then also uh, affording myself to the sort of broader um, Afrikaans variety history, I, I've really sort of struggled between being the Hans by poet and being the poet that can create no matter where she is. Um, and by no means am I wanting to depart from the Afrikaans variety that I speak, um, even in the way that I, and also even using, speaking, creating a, a, a poem, a long narrative poem around um, Hans Bay and Hermanus. Um, I also want to say that even though I grab at the language there, one should also um, consider that one departs from the dialogic, from the um, dialogic imagination, as Buckton puts it. Um, you also the you also go from because uh, many a lot of people look at Afrikaans also considering it as Creole, um, and also the challenging the idea of a patois, um, French patois that indicates that it is a lower form or there's no history or literary history of of gravitas. Um, Jordan, so all sorry, sorry to interrupt. You've got a minute to wrap. Okay. okay, great. So it's just for me, all of these aspects with regards to performativity, to poetry, to, to language um, has really up until now um, informed how one starts to reimagine um, creative arts practice, especially in a um, applied and research um, style. So, yeah, that's my practice and what I'm currently um, looking at. Thanks, Jolan, for a fascinating input. And we will, you know, engage with that um, at the end. So thank you very much. Um, the next speaker um, is Judy Seidman. Um, she was born in Norwalk, Connecticut in the United States in 1951. She went to Achimoto Secondary School in Ghana um, and then to University in Madison, Wisconsin, receiving a BA in Sociology and an MFA painting in 1972. Since then, she's worked as an artist, activist and feminist in South Africa's liberation movement in Zambia, Swaziland and Botswana. And in Gaborone, she was a member of the Medu Art Ensemble and art making collective aimed at creating culture within the liberation struggle in South Africa. She currently lives and works in Johannesburg. Judy? OK, well, um, if possible, I'd like to use images. So I'm going to try and do the share screen. Uh, if you can give me one second to. Uh, Um, 
Okay, so it, you can just put it on. Um, can, can you from see the, the beginning? Screen? Sorry, is it is it PowerPoint? And you can just make it's it a PowerPoint. Page. It's from the beginning. No, yes, from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. As as the introduction said, I was born in America. Um, actually, from radical parents and from a long tradition of feminism. Um, my great grandmother was a leading suffragette in New York. My grandmother on my mother's side was a visual artist when there were very few women visual artists of any status. She was one of the better known um, graphic artists in the early 1900s, uh, 1920s and so on in New York again. Um, my mother, and father, in fact, both saw themselves as Marxists. And so I was brought up with a strong trend towards Marxist feminism, um, including admiring people like Rosa Luxemburg and Alexandra Kollontai, and some women artists, including uh, Katie Kollwitz and Frida Kahlo. Um, and then when I was 11 and my parents moved to Ghana, I went to boarding school and um, my teacher there, my art teacher there was Kofi Antobaum, who was um, at that stage, old, well, he probably what my age is now. I, I was about to say elderly, but hey. Um, and he had been one of the leading activists and artists constructing ideas around Pan-Africanist culture in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Well, he died in 65, four, when I was still in, in school. But certainly that pointed me towards to, um, the whole body of a really rich um, material in Africanist culture, looking at, um, a very different approach towards aesthetics, an approach that talks about um, finding voice, using art to find voice for people, to explore your own realities and to communicate with other people. And of course that was miles and miles away from, <laughs> from the what was being promoted in the US at that point, which was abstract expressionism and art for art's sake. Um, so, just uh, when I went to university in the States, um, these were the kinds of feminist art issues that came up. And I thought it would be interesting to put them here because they're still relevant. Um, the one just talks about representation of women in visual arts, okay, in the Eurocentric set context, but these are still the kinds of issues around representation of women that we that are expected of us today and still repeat today in many places, including when we start talking about decolonialism. They have been embedded in many of our art making structures. So you're looking at stereotype roles, you're looking at, at the people like the virgin or the whore, you're looking at women's bodies being represented as sexual objects, you're looking at um, women only showing traits of vulnerability and passivity, natural, whatever that means, pure, whatever that means, and so on. And of course, that artwork is almost inevitably done from the gaze, from the male gaze. And in the African context, it's most commonly done from the white male gaze. So, um, those, those are ideas that I had as, as, part of the intellectual background. I put the other poster here, by the way, just because it was one I saw that, that came out of that period. And it shows the way people were experimenting with finding um, different ways of portraying women. The one that says um, it's from the Lavender Menace Art Collective, which was a, an American collective. And it reads, Dear Patriarchy, if I know how to make a cake, then I know how to make a bomb, so fuck off. <laughs> Yeah, so when I went to Zambia after that, after I finished university, 
Um, I spent an awful lot of time just walking around the streets, drawing people and trying to find ways of, of, of getting outside of the solely male gaze, if you like, and seeing women as strong, as living their own lives and so forth. Um, but also at the same time, I uh, got involved um, through my, my mother actually worked in the university with Ray Alexander and was, but the family was introduced to the ANC in exile. One of my sisters was working in the ANC head office um, as a secretary. And I then started doing images working with the people I met there. These are some of the ones that were done for Voice of Women, which was the publication that was produced in Lusaka. Um, yeah. Then I also just wanted to put this picture here. This was actually done by Tommy Minelli, but it was his attempt to speak to that generation of women in the 50s. This is a picture of Violet Hasha. She was a trade unionist and an organizer. Um, Judy, can you just move the, the pictures, um, the slides on because we're still on the first slide. Oh, because uh, according to me, it's gone forward, sorry. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure, just a moment. Um, let me go. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go back because yeah, uh, um, it's mo it's moving now. Okay, that was the pictures of the Zambian ones. This was the. Can you see them now? Yeah, we can see them. Okay, so these were the the Voice of Women um, graphics, um, and this was the picture of uh, by the Tommy Minelli of Violet Hasha, who uh, as well as being an organizer and a incredibly powerful speaker by all accounts. She was blind and the young man standing next to her is actually her guide. He's not somebody managing her in any way. Um, but um, yeah, so um, then when I got to Botswana, I'm, I'm gonna sort of skip over some of this. The period in Swaziland, um, I was in Swaziland for five years. I was married, I had two kids. It was the time of the 76 uprising. Um, and I worked at that time with Patikan Tuli, who was teaching at Togoza School, which was set up by the UN for refugees from Soweto. So there was also all of that input um, but Swaziland was an incredibly difficult place to work as a feminist. Um, it was a monarchy and a very patriarch patriarchal society, incredibly patriarchal society. And I always thought that it badly damaged my, my, my own marriage, which <laughs> just having to live under those circumstances. But in any case, that's not particularly relevant to what I want to say here except that um, the next stage was when I went to Botswana and worked with Medu. And Medu Wat Ensemble was established just before I got to Botswana. It was in fact pretty much most, uh, three quarters of the members were male. Most of the women, in fact, the women who were members tended to be almost all of them, either poets or musicians or in theater. There were no other women in the graphics unit at the time that I joined, although I think one, in fact, also an expatriate joined somewhat later. Um, but Medu was an incredibly intense education and workshop in terms of looking at how do you use art to get people to speak about their lives and to examine their lives, to reconceptualize their lives and to en envisage a future. It was very, very much about finding voice and agency. 
And one of the questions that came up over and over again was how do question issues around women and the issues that women face come up in the arts? Um, I'd like to show this picture. This was done by a, a male colleague actually in South Africa, Figlan, and I can't pronounce his last name. I'm terrible at names. I have to apologize for that. But it was about a scene that he had seen. The original drawing was a scene he had seen in Sukhmakar with the removals of and what struck me looking at this picture, it was not presented as a feminist picture, but you will see that all of the soldiers and the police are white, male, and they're holding guns, and the people they are removing are women and their families. And just as a comment about the situation that people were living in, I found it incredibly striking. And the fact that it was not brought up in a feminist context, it was brought up in a libera liberation struggle context. Anyways, so um, this picture is one that we were asked to do in Botswana, but the, at that point, the newly formed Botswana women's movement called the Mon Basari. Um, the words are women basically ties the nation on their back like a baby carries the nation on their back. Um, it's essentially the Botswana, the Botswana equivalent of saying women, women hold up half the sky or maybe all of the sky in this case. Um, again, as the only woman artist in Meru, they asked us, could we help draw a logo? And I did it. Um, but we did it also in consultation with the um, people setting up among Basadi. So we went through several variations on it. Um, and then this picture, which is one of Medu's most famous, and I am pleased to say that I worked on it, again, is the only woman in the graphics unit. And I just would like to say a little bit about what happened in making this, because the decision to use an image of a strong woman um, and the words from Untuntu Wafasi, in fact, in English, um, that was made by the collective, uh, not just the graphics collective, it was made by the whole Meta collective. And then they asked several of us in the graphics unit to come up with sketches. Mine was pretty much like this. Um, one of the other male colleagues who I think should remain nameless, but just to put on the table, it was definitely not Tommy Minnelli. Um, one of the other male colleagues came up with a picture that had a woman wearing a duke with this incredibly small little hand raised up very weakly over her head and a blank face, not even eyes or a nose, it was blank, and a hourglass figure. And the words at the top of it were, in fact, now you have touched the woman and it stopped there. And we put these two pictures to the um, working group and asked them the visual arts section and had a discussion as to which one we would go with for a poster. And some of the issues that came up with the colleague who had done the other picture said that the fist in the picture that I had done was so big that people would assume it was a man they would not know that was a woman. Um, and he also said it, that he didn't put a, a face in the one that he had done because um, he was getting there. He hadn't done it yet. It would be there eventually. Um, the unit agreed completely to go with this image and this was the result. <laughs> um, but, Basically, those were issues that we debated around. It, they were the kinds of things that came up as debate. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and skip through some of this because I'm going to run out of time. I can see this already. These are just some of the other images that came up in the various liberation movements. This one was from Angola. It's one of my absolute favorites. I think it's a gorgeous picture. Um, 
This one was actually done inside South Africa in the early 1980s. The photographer was a woman in the Afropix Collective. And the words are the words of Dora Tomana, who was a leading woman activist from the 60s and 70s, and at this stage, rather older. Um, and I'd like to show a second picture. This picture was done in, I think in Cape Town in the late eighties. So it was still when the ANC was banned, but the words are the same words in the previous poster from Dora Tamana. And they say, you who have no work speak, you who have no home speak, you who have no school speak, you who have to run like chickens from the vulture speak. We must free ourselves. Men and women must share housework. Men and women must work together in the home and in the world. I open the door for you, you must go forward. Um, but there was this strong tradition in the liberation movement of women and women using culture in various ways to demand that their perceptions and their understanding, and in fact, their agency find a place within the movement. Um, I just, since I'm trying to talk to the intergenerational stuff, I'm gonna leave that for the moment. I, I, no, there's one more thing I must say about Mehdi. Um, as well as voice in and agency, there was also basic principles put into place about the need for uh, Afrocentric methodologies and Afrocentric styles and techniques. And these must also speak to people in the liberation struggle, um, the oppressed who do not have access to the normal out, outlets for art. So artwork was not done for galleries in Rosebank or Santon or New York for that matter. It was done on posters that could be put in the streets or later we also talked about using murals that would be put in the streets and t-shirts that people could wear and so on and so on. A lot of that fell away after 1990 and the big questions as to why, because, but what's very interesting and what I'd like to talk about for the, however much time I have left is how this then. You have about one minute. Oh, one minute. Okay. So then I will start talking about that and start talking about how this was picked up by the women's movement. So starting with the Zuma rape trial, these are pictures from outside the Zuma rape trial. There was a conscious decision to use the visual arts and other arts to give voice to women's struggles and deliberately building upon that history of liberation art. Um, uh, this was a collective um, kenga that we did about Fiseka Kuzwayo. This was actually done at her death, not at the time of the rape trial. Um, this was done with the one in nine campaign. And I think there were probably about 12 of us who worked on this one. Um, these few are a couple of posters that were done by people, not by me, within the One in Nine campaign, particularly. The One in Nine campaign came out of the Zuma rape trial and tried to use the art forms across the board in many different ways. Um, this is a picture of some of the One in Nine artists teaching silk screening to a women's group in Tembisa. Um, I think this was in 20. 10, I could be wrong about that. It might've been 29. Um, but again, it was teaching women those same styles of using posters that could be used on the streets in communities to give voice to what they were actually saying. And it's also self-screening is, is uh, we use it in many, but we also try to increasingly use it because it's something that you can use without resources of having to go to a major lithography printer with lots of money to get something printed. I hate to do this, Judy, but can you wrap? Yeah, okay. Um, it's it's so, fascinating, okay. so I really- Last bit, 
These were also used in performance. This was a combination of dummies and people in um, uh, yeah, complaining about gender violence. Um, and this one was a night vigil for um, uh, Ayanda, um, and sorry, and not Ayanda. I, I'm so terrible at names. You can see her name on the side and her picture, and I can't, I can't call it. We call it at the moment. I apologize. But these are the kinds of posters and the kinds of environment we try to use them in. And then, very lastly, this was a mural that was done on the buildings at Hillbrow outside Con Hill that was then turned into a poster, which tries to speak to both of those traditions of the feminist movement post 2000 um, and specifically um, the issues around the Kenga and um, gender violence and the history of women fighting for women with the liberation struggle over and the slogan freedom now and not in another 60 years um yeah speaks for itself i hope okay thanks thanks judy um i i know some of these images uh specifically the the ones in the 80s mm. and in the struggle time so it's it's really interesting to me to to hear the background to that thank you so much um our next speaker is Kalmesh. Um, she's a South African contemporary artist born Kahauhelo Mutepu Mashilo on 30 October 1994 in Limpopo. She currently works and resides in Pretoria uh, in, in, and graduated in 2017 from the Tswanet University of Technology with a Bachelor of Technology in Fine Arts, cum laude, majoring in sculpture. Kao has participated in various local and international groups, exhibitions, and has completed her Master of Technology in Fine Arts, also cum laude. Her practice and research centers on cow metaphors, gender studies, and generational transformation. I'm going to read you the statement that she said, said, uh, sent us. My name is Kao Mesh. I'm an artist primarily mapping my existence through sculptures. My creative process is guided by my self-given name, Cow. In my daily existence and in my art, I decipher my experiences and thoughts through cow metaphors, cow association, and cow analogies. <clears throat> I create sculptures that speak to the transformation of tradition and culture using synthetic materials and found objects. My artworks are an investigation of the past from a present perspective and a negotiation of possible futures through the cow as a bridge between everything. I like to think of my artworks as energy diagrams, which broadcast personal stories that molded my individual femalehood. So thank you, cow, and over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, and thank you to the hosts for um, inviting me to speak. Um, I'm not going to let you look at my face for 15 minutes. Instead, I'm going to share a slide um hopefully if i can get it right just please give me a second okay everyone can see the slide right yes yes we can see it okay great please just let me know if it also changed Yes, it changed. OK, great. <laughs> OK, so um, in order to speak to my practice, I must also start where it all began and where it's constantly revolving, and that's through my names. Um, so my name is Kauhe Lomuteva Mashilo, as give, um, named by my parents. Kauhe Lo meaning merciful. Mutepa um, means girl, so merciful girl. Imagine that. Um, and Mashilo, obviously, my um, family name. Um, growing up, I never agreed or resonated with the nicknames that people gave me, so I tasked myself to name myself. 
and it was simple maths. Um, I show this to give an idea that it was really just putting half and half together and apart, and it got me to cow. So from cow hello, um, to cow. Um, my mother was not surprised when I started calling myself cow because she had actually been calling me cow from when I was uh, much younger. So the conception of the name was innocent at first, and um, I've since come to realize that cow is really my way of life, has become my way of life, and I've been creating armors to protect this little cow khelo mutepa mashilo. Um, and cow is probably the biggest armor that I have created thus far. Um, to name a few things, I became vegetarian because cow. Um, I stretched my ear to resemble ear tags that we often see on, um, on cow ears. I got my bull ring. Um, this is an image from a while back when I still had a very long dreadlock because I needed a tail as a cow. I had a cow pal that used to um, ring everywhere I went. Um, I also decided to only wear black. I committed to wearing the color black because a cow should never change its spots. And I decided my cow hide would be black. And um, fast forward a few years later, and even though my hair has changed, it still kind of is inspired by the cow in having the two parts on the side resemble the horns and the back part be the tail. Um, beyond this, my name saved me in many different ways. Um, I come from a family with big noses. So of course, as a young, as a young child, I was teased about this. And when I named myself Carl, I said to myself, I don't know any other cow with a small nose. So it only makes sense for me to have this nose. Um, I had major weight insecurities and um, I told myself um, it's probably healthier to be a fuller bodied cow. So I need to let go of that too. Puberty also left dark spots on my face, but as a cow, my body should be spotted. So um, yeah, those are just a few things that I suffered from and I was able to heal from with the simple act of naming myself. I believe that I married the name. And I married the name Carl because when a name saves you, when it heals you, you can only but marry it. So Carl is my spirit name. And I can feel that this name is guiding me. And it's because of this name that I create the work that I, that I do too. So I'll go a bit into, briefly into some of the works that I have created, um, a little bit about where it kind of started with drawings on faux leather. On faux leather. Um, this started with a conversation around the insecurity of being in this body. Um, it started with the conversation of skin and body. So these drawings on, on faux leather introduced the cow and female hybrid. And um, I used metaphors and these analogies to either speak of my experiences or to negotiate and critique the things that my body experiences um, purely because of just being in this body and the struggles that I felt that um, I experienced throughout my life. Um, so skin and body, was the topic that I did that I wanted to sort of speak about by um, having these drawings on skin. Um, the thought also came from the imagine the imagined animal skin that would be laid on the on the floor and um, how it was so normal to just see that um, a skin of a body being walked all over. Um, I even imagined the butcheries that we that we often see, or biltong store where flesh hangs and death kind of lingers around these spaces, um, and I I imagined how similar that is to hearing about another woman losing their life um, in our country. Then the cow also inspired um, 
this work in terms of labor when I think of the cow plowing fields where um, I first gravitated towards the idea of cows being on all four um, and in my human form being on all four on all fours reminded me of prayer and I started using this bowing down figure as a metaphor for spiritual movement as much as it's still there's movement happening spiritually but um, this also gave birth to a personal critique of the religious spaces that I grew up in and the gender hierarchies that I feel exist exist in these spaces or in church and my experience and my own discomforts um, being in a female body and experiencing a church environment. So the all fours started off as a conversation between spiritual power and physical submission and um, as well as the sanctity versus explo exploitation. Um, then the crawling thing also developed into herds of cows. So the herds started being these figures that present themselves no longer singularly, but sometimes in groups. And um, these figures come, they come back frequently and sometimes they show up in divided herds, sometimes they show up in together herds and moving across these landscapes that I feel are, they are searching or finding um, different realms. And I say landscapes, but this corrugated surface um, was inspired by seeing a slaughtering actually happen um, at a family gathering. I've, I've grown to um, be more inquisitive and in learning about my culture in why things are important and need to happen the way that they happen. Um, I have a, a vivid image of um, a ceremony happening where um, the blood was kind of drained on this corrugated um, surface. And today I think of that corrugated surface as something that kind of drains the energy or moves the energy out of the flesh into the space that it's being, that the flesh is serving, so to say. Um, yeah, so these landscapes also when they are displayed hang at 45 degree angles. And I wanted that to happen because I almost imagined these corrugated, um, the way that a roof would almost work where the water drains down, I imagined these corrugated landscapes flowing energy into the spaces that um, these works are exhibited in. So just a bit um, of these works again. I have these three three surface levels. So there's the first canvas with um, with line drawings, and I almost imagine that as a water realm. I have some connection to water. I think um, that the drawings that I make are are some kind of mimicry of how water moves, and um, there's a world that I've created with these figures becoming sort of the landscape made of water, these water bodies. So with this specific work, I imagined um, this herd coming to the end of this landscape um, and drinking from this different realm or sub maybe about to submerge itself into this different realm. Um, then much like my own hair and the way that I exist and, um, in person, um, my works start having their own their own developments, and one of those is the horns um, of the, of my bigger figures. Um, I sometimes call them scrolls because um, they read as as sort of tubes that carry something, and and that's possibly knowledge. So I was I was definitely one of those people that were raised to be non-confrontational or not aggressive. And I think that these horns are a result of that, that I made um, these horns that are supposed to be this protective, sharp object, I suppose, um, of the cow be become not so sharp and not so aggressive. 
um, but they show a strength in wisdom um, rather than in, in aggression um, physically. So in these works, I also wanted to create alder figures, um, figures that I could talk to. So I imagine myself almost in the space speaking to these works and these works become figures from another world, but also this world, or they become alders that speak to us and tell us about the worlds that existed before we, we were here and maybe keys and insights to get to the next worlds. Are we doing anything right? <laughs> that kind of a thing. Um, then into more recent works, I've, um, I've come to see how my name is directly influencing um, the works beyond just the metaphor, but um, and beyond just cow. But cow is kind of the name cow is um, getting me into the space of finding out about the past, and in doing so, discovering my other names and being able to embrace the names that I had difficulties with um, growing up. Um, so this work is one part of a collaborative work between my brother and I, which speaks to our family praises. Um, and I think that together these works, when they stand together in conversation, is interesting because it's from both male and female perspective. Um, I've always had a, a reserved space for why our clan praises in my, in my family specifically seem to glorify um, the male presence. And I've always been wondering where the female might be or how maybe those clan praises intend to archive the female lineage of the family. Um, I don't feel that it, it does it enough and maybe I'm yet to discover or understand why, but um, so this work for me becomes special in me speaking of the female um, in our family lineage, um, you know, with the, with the family praises. Cal, you've got two minutes. No. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm sorry. We should have given no. more time for the seminar. <laughs> no, it's fine. So I'll just um, go through. There was only a few more works anyway. Um, this being the last one which speaks to my middle name, Mutepa, which was given to me by my grandmother on my maternal side. There's a whole, there's a whole thing in philosophy, a uh, way of doing this name thing culturally. And I guess I'm also sort of um, negotiating with that. And um, to be named from my maternal side um, also puts this pressure of, femalehood on me, um, or I put myself, I put on myself. Um, so this cow metaphor again brings me all the way back to my second name and through these names I'm finding out so much about myself that I think is universally aligned. Um, so I've been very clingy to my names and uh, I was at a conference in Ethiopia and Dr. Net Sanet um, spoke, spoke about something um, this might be out of context, but I do just want to share. She said something along the lines of women are always strangers, that we are strangers in our own homes because people know that we'll leave soon or in a traditional setting, how a woman will get married off. So um, you're a stranger in your home because you're going to leave eventually. And when you leave, you become a stranger in this new home that you that you are joining. And what I took from that was um, how important a name is, because usually when you move to a new family, your surname changes. Um, so for me, the clinginess of my name grew even bigger when I heard um, this. And I thought to myself that while Cow is not my official green book name, um, I think it's powerful that I've named myself and I've, I have a name that serves me and I could never be a stranger to myself because of this name. I mean, this name has, to me, I believe this name has become my feminism. So yeah, I'll end there. Thank you so much, Kao. I am in awe of the embodiedness of your of your art and, and how you managed to capture that. So thank you for that. It, it's really amazing. 
Thank you. Thank you for listening. Our, um, Azul Kutsir is, is our next speaker. Um, she's a postdoctoral research researcher at the Center for the Study of the Afterlife of Violence and the Reparative Quest at Stellenbosch University. And I can also say she used to be my postdoc. <laughs> so so we, we have a history. In her work, she explores the relationship between gender and race in colonial logic and the role of gender liberation in the project of decolonization. Her research is published in various international feminist journals like Apatia, Feminist Review and the European Journal of Women's Studies. She is the writer of uh, work of creative nonfiction and my fell a race in Afrikaans 2019. Uh, in which she explores white Afrikaner identity and national belonging, and the novel Die Tien Oorgestelde is net so waar in 2021 about female friendship, queer love, and alternative modes of kinship. Thanks, Azal. Hi, everyone. Uh, my presentation, I'm just going to share a few thoughts, uh, so it is much less um, interest, it will be much less interesting to look at than the other presentations, but I hope to um, maybe bring up some theoretical points that we could discuss. Um, well, again, now it sounds like I'm splitting theory from art, uh, which I don't want to do, but yeah, you'll see what I mean. And I'll be quick. I think it's like 11 minutes. The world is looking particularly bad at the moment, to the extent that it is not necessary to rattle off a list of things that are terribly wrong. Maybe it feels extra bad because we are at a time where it should be better. We have access to countless archives of carefully cultivated knowledge. We've recorded and theorized history. We've been through the wars. We've confessed so many sins. We have vast bodies of scientific research measuring the harm. We hear people speak their pain. Your phone is steeped in it. Why are things not getting better? During the early stages of the pandemic, there was so much talk about how the center cannot hold. Arundhati Roy wrote about how we are at a portal to something new. And we saw it too, talked about it tirelessly. Two years on, we know she was wrong. Or if not, if there was a portal, it closed before we could enter. Whatever the things we are up against in 2022, it is always also the abstract workings of global capital, a mutable and highly adaptive force that sides with established power, a force that runs on extraction, black death, a force that requires the binary division of and deep inequality between men and women, rich and poor, the West and the rest, colonizer, colonized, a climate that we cannot step outside of, that we can only hope to transform from the inside, our attempts to do so always inevitably at some point becoming part of the system itself. Where am I going with this? Something that is striking if you move in my circles, right through it all is the narrative about the redemptive and transformative power of art. Art as antidote to global capital, art as resistance to the Manichaean thinking that splits us off from our bodies, from nature, from place, from self, from other, art as reminder, art as critical memory, art as subversive futurity. And because of all these things, and particularly relevant for our purposes here today, art as a mode of decolonizing praxis. We see it permeating popular culture, the idea that whatever we are up against, art offers a glimmer or an option of something else, and that is what we can hold on to. Mostly, I really believe this, because you have to, what else is there? But not always, not on the days when I force myself to open Daily Maverick and properly read the news about British-owned diamond mines continuing to poison the water of villages in Lesotho, the harrowing reports of malnourishment of children in the Eastern Cape, killing of land activists. I struggle to believe in the real decolonizing power of art this week when we are left to reckon with a brand new but age old nasty racist incident at one of the male residences at this, my illustrious institution of higher learning. One could question the idea of the transformative power or more specifically decolonizing potential of art from many angles. The most obvious perhaps is the idea that it could be naive to think that the poems we write, the paintings we make have any power against structures of global extractive capital, against the onslaught of the attention economy on people's strung out minds especially when anything with reach is eaten up by the market, co-opted into maintaining the status quo. 
But it is useless and defeatist to think like this. And it is, it is something I try to avoid. It is not where I will be taking you today. We cannot think decolonization from within existing paradigms. The second, more complicated, but more important place from which doubt about the decolonizing power of writing or art emerges for me is about the convenience of such a belief in the white settler psyche, the function that it can fulfill for you if you are white and privileged, working as a feminist philosopher and believe yourself to be a good person. Am I doing the work of decolonizing modes of feminist, production, feminist knowledge production when I seriously read novels by African women writers, when I attend art exhibitions and theorize them with feminists late at night over big glasses of wine, if I write a memoir about white guilt, if I formulate long and silky sentences holding more than one truth at once, when I take slow meditative walks in nature, get enough rest, if I think about decolonization all the time and tell you about it, is thinking, talking, and writing about decolonization the same as decolonizing? Or do I immerse myself in art and writing because I like doing it, because it is interesting and beautiful and makes me feel better without requiring of me to give anything up? Of course, decolonial theory says doing is thinking and thinking is doing. And this comes in very handy if your field is philosophy and your university is Stellenbosch, your craft is writing, your friends are introspective millennials, and your home is a north-facing apartment in a leafy suburb of inner city Cape Town. Besides, a footnote here, if knowledge was all that was needed to change the world, then surely the right to abortion wouldn't be so easily discarded in a place like America today. For this talk, I think my main aim is to raise these questions rather than to provide an answer, which I don't know how to do. But the formulation of these, but in the formulation of these thoughts, I realized that one route through which to think through these questions would be to return to the question of what decolonization means. What are we talking about when we are talking about decolonization? This led me to revisit a classic text, a classic text, one that many of you might know very well parts of which I want to bring you back to for the next few minutes. In their famous 2012 article, Decolonization is not a metaphor, Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Yang list the things that decolonization is not. It is not converting indigenous politics to a Western doctrine of liberation. It is not a philanthropic process of helping the at risk and alleviating suffering. It is not a generic term for struggle against oppressive conditions and outcomes. Decolonization is not a metonym for social justice. Tuck and Yang are responding to what they see as the centering of the idea of decolonizing the mind in our understandings of the project of decolonization. They remind us that Fanon understood decolonizing the mind as the first step, not the only step toward overthrowing colonial regimes. If the cultivation of critical consciousness is presented as the sole activity of decolonization, rather than pursuing the work of liberation in the specific structural and interpersonal categories of native and settler, it extends innocence to the settler, it, it entertains a settler future. This is Tak and Yang. They write against the domestication of decolonization, against turning it into an empty signifier to be filled by any track towards liberation. So what is decolonization? Tuck and Yang provide a strikingly simple answer. Decolonization in the settler colonial context must involve the repatriation of land simultaneous to the recognition of our land and relations to land have always already been differently understood and enacted. That is all of the land and not just symbolically. They also quote Fanon, who says, decolonization never takes place unnoticed. Tak and Yang center land because within settler colonialism, the most important concern is land, water, air, subterranean earth, which they refer to collectively as land. Settlers make indigenous land their new home and source of capital, and this violence is not temporarily contained in the arrival of the settler, but is reasserted each day of occupation. So they argue that it is a settler move to innocence to focus on decolonizing the mind and therefore to allow conscientization to stand in for the more uncomfortable task of relinquishing stolen land. 
a criticism that has been leveled against Duck and Yang is that they are setting up a false binary between the symbolic and the material, that their central focus on land allows an erasure of everything that is so deeply symbolic and metaphorical about processes of colonization and structures of coloniality. But I think such a reading, such a critical reading of them is too simple. Tak and Yang repeat more than once that the processes of settler land occupation also constitute an epistemological, ontological and cosmological violence because they affect the interruption of indigenous relations to land on various levels and symbolically recast these relations as pre-modern and savage, thereby ideologically validating and naturalizing settler claims to land. The decolonizing work of repatriating stolen land is therefore also the deep work of knowing and seeing the extent of colonial violence of mapping the elsewhere. Very importantly, for Tak and Yang, decolonization is not work that can be wrapped up into a neat, peaceful ending. Too much has been irretrievably lost, irreversibly harmed, and this loss and harm continue. Colonization is a structure, not an event, says Patrick Wolfe. This makes the project of decolonization different from the pursuit of social justice, argued Tak and Yang. Social justice is understood to provide relief for a presumed victim or prepares wholeness. It is presented as a form of destination. Two, two minutes, Azul. Okay, I'll be done. And fixing. In contrast, decolonization requires something else, something that Tak and Re theorize as haunting. Haunting is the relentless remembering and reminding that will not be appeased by settler society's assurances of innocence and reconciliation. Haunting doesn't hope to change people's perceptions, nor does it hope for reconciliation. Haunting lies precisely in the refusal to stop. Social justice aims to right the wrongs, haunting aims to wrong the wrongs. So decolonization is a recognition that a ghost is alive and we are in relation to it. And this is where art comes in, I think, one way of understanding its decolonizing power. If there's something that art can do exceptionally well and better than most other things, it is to mediate haunting, enact it, register it. And I think this is what we very powerfully see happening in the work of all three artists who spoke before me. Um, it's, yeah, it's hauntings that they are busy, they are busy haunting or they are, yeah, attending to ghosts. I think there are many ways of thinking about it. So if I'm asking, to wrap up, these are my last few sentences. So if I'm asking how my writing, reading, thinking, making as settler subject can contribute to the project of decolonization, the repatriation of land, then perhaps this is one possible way to be haunted to attempt to create work that registers the haunting, that opens me up to a repeated confrontation with the ghosts as specters that collapse time, making the past visible in the present. To live with the haunting without attempting exorcism, without seeking charity, parity, balance or forgiveness, being unsettled as settler subject and continuously upset by the ghosts without looking for repair, asking for peace or negotiating towards resolve. Perhaps it is this that I can do. Done. <laughs> Thanks, Azul. Thanks for that. I think it is quite dense what you what you've said, and and it, it speaks to to the 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 role of art in processes of decolonization. So thank you for that. I think, colleagues, what we've seen here today is the the great variation in thinking about art. And, and knowledge production, um, and that, that was actually quite fascinating. So the floor is open now for questions, comments. Uh, you can put it in the chat box or you can raise your hand. No. Hello? Shall all of us as speakers come up on the screen so everyone can see us and be reminded of the previous presentations? Yes, I think that's a, that's a good idea. Thanks. M maybe you want to, to talk to each other. Um. <laughs> because we, we, we've seen the word art, right? We've seen the embodied art, we've seen the struggle art, 
and I think it all brings some dimension um, of of knowledge creation uh, and production uh, to this to the seminar. I mean, as I said to to Judy, and and here is the generational thing, right? That so many of those posters that you showed, I've seen, and I've I've lived through that period of time. So those those posters were really important, and they were important because they they brought the gender dimension, right? So often we've seen in the struggle posters, uh, you know, the men, men doing, men having agency, men being active. Um, so, so yes, but then we move to to today and we see, you know, how how the spaces have changed for for younger artists to do the type of art that that free frees them from from this um, idea of that life is only about struggle. But you know how how cow you've said this is your feminism, you know, relating to your name and embracing marrying this name is your feminism. So you know I think that embrace is is so important. And Jolyn, I mean you who who are actually rewriting that that erased history. I mean it is it's actually amazing and and saying that how is it possible that a language can just disappear if there's still people you know who are related to this language so so that i think you know and azul you're bringing it to, all together with you know this this the theoretical uh, nature of of the knowledge creation um and as you say we live in in precarious times i mean yeah, so 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 art is really important. Uh, we have a hand. Please ask your question. Um, I don't necessarily have a question. I have a comment for Jaurelo. Um, are those accepted or is it just questions? Yeah, no, please go ahead. OK, thank you. Um, Jaurelo, I just wanted to um, say that your illustration of complex life experiences through sculpture and artwork is um, superb. I also appreciate how close to home you have centered your work. Um, as a black person who identifies female as well, it is quite difficult to see oneself outside of the norm of being invisible or out of place. So the way you have brought yourself to life through art is um, something truly special. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you, Naledi. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. And it, it means the world to know that you're not alone as well. So it really is nice to hear. <laughs> thank you. Cow, do you have any work on exhibition at the moment? Um, right now, only at Nyrox Winter Sculpture Fair, if anybody is in Joburg, um, that's something that you can see physically, but other than that, no. OK, well, for those of you who are lucky enough to be in Joburg, you can go and see it in in real life. Azal, you have a question or a comment? I'll just ask if there's no one else who wants to speak. Um, I was wondering, I want to ask Jolyn, and related to Carl's presentation, um, so I've read Bintang uh, many times and also watched the, the theatre performance, and something about that text is so embodied. It really feels as if you are, in some sense, channeling through a kind of body memory, this this history that you're trying to to reimagine or remember as in putting together. And so I was wondering if if you experience and if we look now at Kao who really uh, lives her art in her like very physical body and it made me think of your relationship to the how you experience your body in the process of, of this writing. Um, I think for me, um, so I call this poem a Ngao poem, um, and Ngao is a is a um, gum word and a Nama word, which means rite of passage. Um, the whole time I was in a sort of ancestral um, 
placing myself, some of it I cannot explain and others I can explain. Um, and also sitting with, um, yeah, so for me, um, at that point when I started writing this work, um, I was in hospital with a, um, a spinal operation where I couldn't walk and I, I couldn't move at all. Um, and that was going to be my my reality. But at that point in time, I sort of noted down the aesthetics of, started thinking about the aesthetics of pain and thinking about how history has informed this body that I have. Um, and and also um, the, the, the spine, because the books that I write, you know, in order for something to be called a book, there needs to be a spine. Um, and so a lot of that things started to happen. And I think since I didn't have history or any sort of archival work to, to give to this woman who doesn't even exist, the only body that I had was mine. The only body that I had was descendant of my mother, who also is is orphan and my dad as well. So that so my lineage stops with them and ends with me. Um, and then also getting in touch with what it means to to be a spiritual spiritual being. Um, sort of, I wouldn't say I let go of it because. Um, memory is very difficult i i read somewhere that trauma doesn't have um um trauma is is not um the pers person who experienced trauma do doesn't have memories they just have trauma which is for me a sort of thing that i thought about that what trauma is goes beyond memory um, because it, it is also something that you inherit. Um, and then also sitting with, I think for me, sitting with womanhood that wasn't explained to me. Um, I remember when I, and I sit with, with Bintang as a woman who is, is not afraid to talk about being upset of becoming a woman because the now also takes a woman, a young woman or a girl from the state of from the state of, of of a child to the state of a transitioned person. And I thought to myself, okay, but what happens if something is interrupted and if you're in the middle, which is what we constantly talk about the liminal um, and sitting in the liminal. Um, and I also sat with with Darlan, can I'm yes. sorry, I, I'm just going to interrupt you there. I want you to continue, but uh, this thing will cut out any minute now. And I just want to thank everybody who came and who participated and who engaged. Uh, thank you so much. And, and to the speakers, thank you so much for your time. It's deeply appreciated. So if we all disappear, it's because it's the end. But Jolan, please continue. Um, yeah, for me, I think was so all of these aspects and then thinking of myself as an indigenous person and and sort of um, everybody is sort of like saying that I've shifted something in Afrikaans, but I'm saying that you're so comfortable because of the way that I look that you're willing to accept what I've done is acceptable. But in many ways, I've never presented myself as representing a euro or even, I think, in fact, by the end of the book, um, I realized that I took this person on a journey because that's where the epic starts. And I, I wanted to create a freedom for this person to be her own woman, to, to create her own society. Um, and yet when you depart from society, um, you're only left with yourself. And that means that you cannot be history because history is an observed practice. Um, and so what even what I've done to sort of liberate and, and be feminist about it ended up being something that I had to surrender. I had to, just like I surrendered um, my body, just like I surrendered history, just like I wanted to depart from, from racial um, images and racial womanhood that was placed on me that I didn't have control of being born from a woman. I... 
I think for me, um, all of this departure, you have to ask yourself um, what the difference is between freedom and liberty and what I liberated and what I set free. And then really, I've never really thought of free freedom having repercussions because that is the absolute for any human being to make a decision not interrupted by anybody, which is what the dictionary says. Um, and and sitting with the journey and, and sitting with um, memories of, of womanhood and memories of, of abuse and memories of um, um, sexual abuse that that is so present in my in my family um, by by my by the women and and how we have in silence um, carried it on from one person um, and so I think for me the generational break is as easy as just writing it writing the story that is the biggest generational break and departure from how stories were remembered and dismembered um, and how you um, how you voice because that's the most important thing about writing is constantly talking about voice and um, so yeah all of these things and people often ask me about the different aspects of it um, but I also had to think about how does one present sexual abuse in a way that is not going to be sexualized because as soon as one read about sexual abuse or read about um, sexual violence um, and you read about the language that has to explain it there's so much sexualization in it that I needed to find a way to find an aesthetic that would carry what was needed um, protect what was needed from the person talking about it. Um, and I used the metaphor of the changes of the bito, which is a berry that was that it grows in my area. And then the different phases of that berry turning from green to red, from green, yellow to red, um, and realizing that everything that I needed, all the language that I needed, that informed my body and informed my womanhood and embodying all of it was always there. I did not actually have to go and look for a history or take one on. Um, and then I think the greatest success of this work is surrendering. Um, and somebody explained it as giving up, but I think surrendering departs from the colonial of speaking on behalf of someone. But surrendering is not just making the, the work silent or making the work because being tongue takes on a physical form um, to be to be in this poem. Um, and I also didn't want to do that. Um, so there were many things that was informed by my own embodying of pain, of um, my own ideas and how I grew up with how abuse and womanhood was explained and I wasn't afraid what people think is messy is human so I do speak I do speak about how the body relates to to things in my area for example the 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 smell of fish and how that um, relates to how a woman's body has been presented and how it smells um, how um, the bitterness under your arms relate to onions, how um, all of these phases um, that are seen as messy and are seen as are, are we saying that messy to mean that that makes you less human, makes you savage, um, you know, has been cleansed by 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 literature and by European practices and even in that instance having to so yeah I had to also depart from presenting a body that is perfect and doesn't smell and doesn't have womanhood because all of these things to me erases what it means to be a human being and to be a, a woman um, and so yeah that was the uh, very important journey for me as a person um, but then the difficult thing for me in the play was I had to depart from my own poetic journey as being a poet to becoming a character and it was like I forgot how to understand Afrikaans because the director kept on talking about intention 
um, with the character. And the only thing I knew was to voice because um, the poet stands still in front of a mic. And now I had to shift my body from one point to the next, breathe from one point to the next. And it felt like for the first time, my body couldn't understand what needed to be done in the physical world. So yeah, it was very interesting to make all of these transitions to eventually become and become and um, the the work as part of me outside of me and um, really making it the audience's responsibility to to take the story with them and 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 take what I I what I needed. Thanks, Dolan. Thanks so much. I mean, so much wisdom uh, that you've spoken there. Uh, and, and truly, I mean, your metaphor of the spine, your spine, Bintang's spine, a book spine, it's it's an incredible metaphor. So, so thank you for that. So we are at the end of, of the seminar. Thank you so much for those of you who came. Um, fortunately, we could go a li little bit over time. And thank you again to the speakers. And we hope to see you at the next um, seminar, the intergenerational seminar that will be on the law, women and the law. Thank you very much. <laughs>